My name is Dr. Caitlin Kite and I'm from the Academic Development Team. I'm here today to speak about public speaking so that you can do it like a pro. In the UK, at least, and probably around the world, we find that public speaking is one of the top five things that people are afraid of. This is known as glossophobia. It's also called speech anxiety, if you don't want such a long word. And it is something that a lot of people fixate on, even from an early age, from uh, getting up on stage in order to deliver lines in a play, or giving presentations in school, even just reading out loud in class. So it's something that is a serious issue that prevents people from wanting to do a lot of the things that come along with having a, a project at university, going to a conference, getting involved with other sorts of academic things that do involve speaking out in the public audience. So it's really good to think about what are some things that you can do to tackle glossophobia, even if you just experience it in a mild way, so that you feel more comfortable engaging with all of these activities and getting the most out of them. There are lots and lots of ways in which you might find yourself using public speaking skills. So for example, if you're a PTA, you might be demonstrating uh, if you are involved in a class, you might be giving a pre presentation, you might be involved in competitions or even just a pub quiz. There are even things like podcasting if you want to do outreach or you have to get good at um, speaking out in public or speaking to the public, I guess. And all of these are things where you need to draw on public speaking skills, but also in doing all of these things, you can find yourself becoming more comfortable with public speaking skills. So it really is about just overcoming those first few barriers, getting yourself into it, and then practicing a whole lot and feeling comfortable as you gain experience. So what are some things to take care of before you start thinking about the style of actual public presenting? So these are things I'm assuming you already know about when you've gotten to the point of thinking about actually giving a presentation. So first of all, you always want to make sure you know why you're speaking and what it is that you're trying to achieve at a particular event. You want to make sure that you've selected an interesting and appropriate message because nothing is worse than knowing you're about to give a really boring talk when you go up to do it. It's going to be really hard to find the energy, find the enthusiasm. You want to make sure that you've considered your audience and how to pitch your message to that particular audience. You're using the right style, you're using the right words, and so on. You want to make sure you have useful supporting materials. Sometimes those are slides. Sometimes you don't need slides. Sometimes you might have really fun stuff that you take in. You might do an experiment in front of people and take a model of something to show off a concept that you're discussing. You also want to make sure that you're aware of and can work within any constraints that are associated with a particular type of public speaking event. Uh, so for example, if it's going to be outdoors, and it's quite a windy, rainy sort of day, and there's a lot of noise because of that, do you have a microphone that you can take with you? Or can you, if nothing else, hold a bullhorn in front of your mouth so that you can be heard more widely? So just thinking about little details like that to make your life easier. So all of that, that's part of a whole other talk, and I'm not going to address that here. I'm purely going to be speaking about the actual presentation part of that sort of performance. So let's think about some tricks for improving your public speaking. First of all, as I already sort of alluded to earlier, practice really does make perfect. The more you do this stuff, the better you become at being aware of different dimensions of a performance, but also of being able to adjust those and to adapt those in the moment, but also beforehand as you're planning. And I think there are four main areas to consider. First of all is messaging, so saying the right things, um, feeling comfortable with your slides, having smooth transitions, just having a sort of relaxed approach to getting across the information that you want to share. Mannerisms are another thing. Do you have a good presence? Are you gesticulating too wildly? How does your voice sound? And these are all things that you can really work on if you record yourself and look back, and it's really painful. Nobody likes to see themselves on film, at least at first but it's incredibly helpful because that's when you realize that you are doing this too much and that it's quite distracting. It's when you realize if you just do this a whole bunch, we called this the high school shuffle when I first learned about presenting. You can find out if you always stick your hands in your pockets, all of those sorts of things that people in the audience will notice and be distracted by. You can also become more aware of environment. 
So that's things like, what are the acoustics in this space? Is it really echoey? Do I need to slow down so that my words don't sound like they're running into each other? You can think about whether your slides function, whether the computer is working the way that it should. A classic issue is having uh, created slides on a Mac and then having to deliver them on a PC and finding that actually it doesn't work because there are slight differences in how PowerPoint works. You want to make sure that you're familiar with the clicker and the pointer. And that might seem really silly, but sometimes the forward and back buttons are in different places. And so you're trying to move forward and you end up getting the laser and you feel silly. So it's really basic stuff like that. And then also the timing. This is really key. When people get nervous, they tend to rush. They also just want to get off the stage. And so they talk really fast. You can tell that someone's nervous when they're talking fast and that it's not just excitement. It's hard to understand them. It can make you a bit nervous as an audience member. And so it is really key to practice so that you get to the right time. It's also quite important to make sure you've got the right amount of content because sometimes people want to talk about 30 slides worth of things in 10 slides worth of time. And so you need to make sure you're not having to race just to fit everything in. If you are doing that, you've not diluted your message down enough. You've not really focused on the thing that you need. You also don't want to find that actually, uh, because you're talking so fast, you find yourself with 10 extra minutes, and you then have to stand there awkwardly or answer really tough questions. So it just really helps to think about all of these issues and run through things ahead of time for each time you're presenting, but also from one presentation to another, you'll start to find that these things smooth out. Another really important thing is being genuine. It's really difficult to go up and do a presentation to get the information across, to be aware of those four categories of things I mentioned on the last slide, while also pretending to be someone else and to be acting. And, and as you're acting, you're often thinking about how you're standing and what words you're using, and it becomes really distracting to be someone else. It's going to be much easier if you just are you. And that even includes how you are dressing and the words that you're choosing and the passion with which you speak. All of those things, whatever makes you comfortable in yourself on the day, that's what, what's going to let you to get your energy and enthusiasm and excitement across, and that's what's going to take the audience along on the journey with you. So obviously there are going to be certain boundaries. Um, perhaps if you're a, a nudist, you're not going to want to stand up naked in front of a crowd of people that's, uh, that are not themselves nudists or at a nudist event. But in general, you would want to try to be as comfortable as you can so that you can project the right thing on the day. So you're not projecting a performance, you're projecting the message you want to get across. I also think it's really important to remember that it's fine to be nervous. Most people are nervous. Even people who are experts who give loads and loads of presentations, they might not be feeling fear and anxiety, but they're still getting the same sort of energetic feelings before they go out on stage. They're getting butterflies in their stomach. They're feeling a bit of tingling in their hands. They might feel their heart racing a bit. All of that stuff is quite normal. It's stuff that we've evolved to have so that we have you know, fight or flight, but it also is something that musters all of our energetic reserves. And when you've got a lot of energy, you can use that. You can use it to project your enthusiasm and your message, and you can really use it to captivate an audience. So run with it and use it to your advantage. I think it's really important in order to help you do that, to kind of channel it a bit, to start off with a long, deep breath, because when you are feeling nervous and your heart is pounding, you start to get a bit frantic, you have shallow breaths, and then you find yourself gasping in between sentences, and it's really difficult, and it can be quite noticeable. So start off with a really long breath to get your lungs full, to, to calm your heart down, and then you can speak a bit more naturally after that, and it will really help. It's also important to drink water beforehand and to take water up with you wherever you're presenting because inevitably, even if it's just because you're talking a lot, your mouth will get a bit dry. But often we get dry mouth when we're nervous. And then you start doing this weird thing when you click because you're nervous and your mouth has gone dry and your tongue sticks to the roof of your mouth and that's really embarrassing also. So take water and the water can also give you a chance to pause and collect your thoughts and get your breath. So it's a good distraction technique as well. You'll want to choose your clothes wisely. So again, not just 
to be yourself and to have your style, but also, for example, if it's an incredibly hot stage, maybe you don't want a wool suit. Uh, maybe if you can go with shirt sleeves or um, no sleeves if you're able to do that sort of thing while still being appropriately dressed. It can be really helpful because you will be warped up, you might start to sweat. Uh, if people gesture like this and you see the sweat stains, you often feel uncomfortable looking back and knowing that that was you. So just think about how can you dress to cover that up or to prevent it. Try not to use the pointer. Um, often you find with the pointer, people's hands are shaking so much that um, it really shows that they're quite nervous. And on top of that, we know that a lot of people struggle with pointers because they're hard to see, they aren't good for folks that have uh, epilepsy, so actually you might as well just do away with the pointer. If you really need to show something, just do this. It's a lot less noticeable if your hand is shaking. And for all of these things, I think you should think positively. So as I said earlier, all of this is a very natural response. It allows you to generate a bunch of energy and you can use that to your advantage. You also will want to be as responsive to the audience as you can be. So depending on the type of performance that you're involved in, the type of presentation, you might not have a whole lot of flexibility, but often you do. You can look out there and see the faces of people and get a sense of how are things going down. And often you'll have this happen automatically because you will see people who are smiling, you'll see people who are taking notes and they'll nod their heads, there might be laughter, all of those things are really good signs. But there might be other signs as well. People might look confused, they might have really stony faces because perhaps you're not being clear enough or you're talking too fast and they can't understand. Maybe people look bored. Um, is there a lot of fidgeting going on? Are people starting to pull out their phones and get distracted by things? Are people wanting to ask questions? Now sometimes things, questions happen in the middle, sometimes questions happen at the end, so you can't always use that to gauge. But these are all the sorts of cues that you can start picking up on. And if you do find that people are a bit dull, they aren't really into it, maybe you can disrupt that and ask a question and get them to answer. You can get folks to do a show of hands. You can get them active in some way, pull them back with you, and get them back in line and get them engaged again. So just because you start to see these things, and it happens to absolutely everyone, whether you're teaching or doing outreach or giving a public talk, you will find this happen at some point. And you just have to be aware of it and then have a few tricks up your sleeve so that you can respond. I think a really key thing as well is telling a good story. So you're less likely to encounter those problems on the last slide if you're being riveting to begin with. And you can do that by properly telling a narrative. So you don't just throw a bunch of facts at people, but you weave them together in a way that takes folks on a journey with you. You have a beginning where you're grabbing the audience's attention. You often find that expert speakers will come out onto the stage and say something absurd to grab everyone's attention and then they'll explain that later on. Or they'll tell a joke, or they'll ask for a vote and get a show of hands so that they can then uh, argue against that or argue with it. So you find that people often have something that's really big up front to immediately captivate people. You then want to have a middle section where you're starting to convince them of whatever message you started to unveil at the beginning. So you might be showing data, you might be making comparisons, you might be making contrasts or sharing funny stories, but all of these things are supporting the thesis, for lack of a better word, that you started out with there as you entered into the performance. And finally, when you end, now often an end can be satisfying because you've come to the end of the journey, you have an answer to the question, there's a conclusion to whatever story was being told, and that feels quite nice. And that's all right if that's where you want to leave it. But it's also often quite helpful if you leave people with something to action. So maybe that's just saying, and here's how this impacts you in your daily life. Or maybe it's saying, now that you know this, go out and do this thing. Go tell a friend about this. See if there's something that you can change in your own daily life. So it can be really helpful to take whatever your final message is and make it something that people can really do something with. A really key part of presenting and giving a public speech is to actually speak and not to read. Now there are certain disciplines where the practice is that you write a paper and then when you're presenting you are just reading that paper. That's why we call it giving a paper at a conference. 
Uh, I happen to come from a discipline where this is not the norm, and I still find it incredibly weird when I go to any sort of public event and people are standing there reading something, because I think that that immediately puts a barrier between the speaker and the audience. And I know that it's hard, especially if you're not in a discipline where slides are used, it can feel really weird to just stand up there and ad-lib without something behind you. So this is something that you can think about. What is your discipline norm? What do you feel comfortable with? But wherever possible, I think that you don't want to be reading. You want to be looking at the audience, talking to the audience, talking with the audience, making them feel like you're having a real conversation. So don't read a prepared essay if you can avoid it. Don't read off of note cards, although it's good to have note cards in case something goes awry and you get lost. You can have them and they can remind you and then you can look back up and, and get back into your story. And don't read off the slides. Now this is something that a lot of people struggle with because they feel afraid of ad-libbing, they feel afraid of getting off the message, they think that they're going to say too much or too little. This is what uh, I was referring to in that first slide when I said that it's really important to practice. You need to know your slides in and out. You need to have gone through them so many times that you know what's coming next, that you know what you need to say, that you don't say anything extraneous. So sometimes you don't have the time for this luxury because something was put together quickly and you just had to dive in and do it. But where possible, put in that time ahead of time so that you don't have to read off of the slides. As I said, you might need note cards or you might need a printed out version of your speech or you might want um, your slides printed up with some comments on it because it is really helpful to have something in case you get lost, in case the power goes out, uh, in case any sort of catastrophe happens. That is something, if nothing else, it helps you feel comfortable so that you know you've got a safety blanket there, you know you've got a net to catch you if you do fall. With slides, it's also really important to think about what you're putting on them, what you can omit from them, how the slides are actually helping to supplement what you're saying, are they distracting from what you're saying, really put some thought into the visuals that you're taking into um, a, a public talk. I would say that it's best to only have the essential information. If you put too much, people are going to be reading it and not listening to you. Uh, if you put too little, they might have no sense of what's going on, why have you put that there. But it is good to have a few bullet points just in case people want to take notes, in case it helps people who have accessibility issues and they need a bit of guidance or they need it to jog their memory, memory or in case they can't hear you very well, and so on. So it's quite good to have a few bullet points, but you don't want to fill the text with slides. One rule of thumb is basically no more than three ideas on a slide. It's really helpful if you're using the slides to reiterate what you're saying. Um, so for example, if you say something in words and then you have an image that supports that, that can be really helpful. So it's not just, I say a sentence and that sentence is also listed here, but it's two things that work synergistically to get the point across. You can also use it to confirm your message. So for example, if you say, we found uh, that as temperature increased, the animals responded in this way, you could have a graph where you have temperature and response, and it goes up. And so quite clearly it's showing that you aren't just making this up, there's real data there. Using the slides to illustrate your message kind of falls in with this as well, but it might also be things like, uh, if, if, especially if you want to refer to a visual sort of thing, it can be really helpful to have a picture. So if you say uh, that you were ta you're talking about doing field work and you say, well, we worked in wetlands, it was quite difficult to reach many of the sites and so we used this method to compensate. And then you can have a picture of the field site showing the wetland, showing you in action, and that can explain to the audience and justify what you're saying at the same time. So these two things often do go together. It's also really important wherever possible to use your own content uh, so the field, uh, field site example is a good one. If you're doing research, it doesn't have to be scientific, doesn't have to be outside, but get photographs along the way that support and document what you're doing so that when it comes time to show that, you have images that you can use to explain yourself. If you are going to use someone else's content, make sure that you're able to. So find something that's copyright free or purchase the copyright. If you've purchased it, make sure that you can attribute someone. So just make sure that you're not stealing any content and running into intellectual property issues and so on. So the photographs in these slides, for example, have all been downloaded from a website that offers 
clip art for free. So there are resources out there if you don't have the budget for that sort of thing. One of the key things that I noticed when I was an undergrad first attending conferences is that you often have people who stand up and apologize for the fact that their font is really small or the coloring is really bad or things don't work well with the lighting in the room and so on. And my personal feeling is that that makes you look like a really poor presenter because it shows that you haven't actually thought about the audience or really cared about their experience as you were creating um, the, the slides or the content or whatever it is that you're apologizing for. It also indicates that you probably haven't gone into the room beforehand, put up the slides, looked at the lighting, stood in the back to see, and so on. So I think that wherever possible, and again I realize that sometimes things have to be done at the last minute, but you want to do all of that legwork ahead of time because you want the audience to feel invested and to feel like you care about them and are engaging with them and are taking them along on that journey. So do everything you can to set it up to be inviting and to help them out. And as you're doing that, think also about inclusivity. So red, green, colorblind, for example, any sorts of flashing lights might be problematic. As I said, laser pointers aren't great. If you have people who are dyslexic, it might help to have a, blue, um, a pale blue background or use certain fonts. All of those sorts of details, the more you encounter them and use them, the more fluidly that will happen in the future. But just try to make yourself aware and get in the habit of doing all of this so you don't stand up there and think, actually, that graph is really small. People in the 10th row aren't going to be able to read that. And if you are stuck with those sorts of things, so often we do have problematic images or graphs and so on, what you can do is offer an alternative format. So you can take handouts to accompany the slides. You can say, I've got these posted online. Here's the URL for that. You can circulate it through an email to support whatever you're doing. It really depends on what the actual talk is and, and the context of it. But there are lots of ways that you can get around not being able to have exactly the perfect thing on the day. Associated with some comments that I made earlier about how much content you have per slide and practicing to make sure that you're not going too speedily or um, too slowly, you really want to make sure that you're not rushing. And this is something that I mean within the context of all the slides, so you're not going to be racing through and ending five minutes early, as I said, but also as you are speaking, make sure that you're taking the time to enunciate, that you are putting the right emphases on things, that you have dramatic pauses if you want them so that people can think a little bit and wonder what's coming next. You also want to have the time to gather your own thoughts because every now and then your mind starts going somewhere else while you're talking and you realize you're not sure what you're saying so you need to pull yourself back. So all of this can be accommodated by not rushing. My father is a radio journalist and one of the tips that he gave me quite early on was that when he was recording uh, newscasts, he had been told as a university student himself that you should read into the microphone as though you are reading a story to a child. And that will feel quite awkward to you as you are doing it because it feels like you're being very slow. But to someone listening in, it actually just sounds very clear. It means that each word is distinct. It gives you time to hear what they're saying, to think about it, and to engage with it. And none of it sounds too rushed. And when you aren't rushing, it means you're also less likely to trip over your own tongue, to say the wrong word, to get confused, and so on. So it's really helpful not just to the audience, but also to you. And this is something, again, where if you have a bit of a recording of yourself, you can play that back and listen and say, you know, what am I having trouble with? This is also something that's really great for accessibility, because we will have people in our audiences that are not native speakers of whatever language we're delivering in. Uh, there will be people that have, perhaps, language issues anyway, even if they do speak the, the language. They're just a bit slower, or they get caught up on certain words. And it just is more accommodating if you speak at a more relaxed pace. And as I mentioned earlier, it can be really uncomfortable if you're in the audience and you see someone who's rushing. It makes you quite nervous. And if someone is up there speaking at a more relaxed pace, it's much better um, from the, the viewing perspective. This probably seems a bit cheesy, but it is true that this is a stressful experience. And if nothing else, it can take a lot of energy 
So it's quite helpful to look after yourself when you're thinking about giving a, a public lecture of some sort. Definitely get sleep beforehand. Uh, if you don't, you might want to compensate with caffeine, but if you do that, you're going to just contribute to the jitters, make yourself even more nervous and worked up and shaky, and that's probably not going to be really helpful. It is really helpful to stay hydrated, however, and when you do that, be thinking about some other warm beverages besides the caffeine. So not the coffee and tea, but perhaps um, warm water with lemon and honey in it to help your throat a little bit, or something with a bit of ginger, or just something that helps you relax your muscles. And this is going to be helpful, especially if you're talking for quite a long time. Uh, or if you're at a conference, for example, you might be having many conversations throughout the day, as well as the talk that you're giving. This is the sort of thing that can help your voice so that you don't go hoarse by the end of the event. If you have a chance before you're going to go speak, warm up a little bit. That might be um, just talking with a friend. It might be pacing around in the bathroom, muttering your talk under your breath. Whatever it looks like, it can be helpful. Because when we present, even if there's a microphone, most of us do tend to start automatically projecting to the back of the room. And when you're doing that, you are using your muscles more, you're using more energy, that's more hard on your throat, and so it, it does help to warm up your voice a little bit so that that's not quite um, as shocking to your vocal cords as it might otherwise be. It can be really helpful also if you do a bit of a mini workout, and this is the kind of thing that can help get your energy going, but it can also help work out your nerves. So I don't know, it really depends on where you're going to be and how much of an idiot you feel like looking like in front of people, but if you can go do a few push-ups or some jumping jacks or something like that, then you can get rid of that nervous energy and you can have a bit of a burst and distract yourself and then go out there right afterwards and ride that wave a little bit better and, and pick the audience up with you. I also always suggest showing up early. There's nothing more nerve-wracking than having to race to your talk, to your event, whatever it is, and worrying that you're not going to get there in time, worrying about what it looks like, oh my gosh, I haven't loaded my slides, whatever that looks like. So you definitely want to go ahead of time to look at the space and to think about whether your slides and your performance are going to work, but at the event itself, you also want to make sure that you're there so that you don't have to rush right before you actually have to speak. So let's say you do all of those things and you go up and you give your talk and it was fabulous, great, but that doesn't mean that you just don't ever think about it again. So with, with all of these things that you do in life, whether it's a public talk or um, a test that you took or some other really formative experience, you don't want to just finish it and set it aside. You want to reflect on it because that's how you can get better. So take some time to think, what was so great about that talk that I gave? Why did that go so well? Put those aside, those, those rules, so that you can then draw on that next time, so that you can apply them and make the next experience really good as well. Or, if it wasn't so great, think about what did I do wrong? Where did I not quite put in enough time and effort? How can I manage this so that next time I do something different, so I have these rules, I'm gonna change some things, and then suddenly it's going to be excellent. And keep in mind that no matter how good or bad an experience was, each thing will have pros, each thing will have cons. It's never going to be a complete loss. It's never going to be completely perfect. There are always going to be things that you can work on. There are always going to be things that have saved the day. So just be fair and look at all of those and extract whatever information you can get so that you can always be improving, always be feeling more comfortable, always be feeling more confident, and at some point you realize that these things do have a certain effortlessness to them because you have uh, internalized all these little rules that you've come up with and you now feel really expert in what you're doing and you can turn around and perhaps teach someone else a few tricks as well. So hopefully this advice will make you feel a bit more confident as you approach the next public speaking event that you do, whatever form that takes, and keep in mind that practice really does make perfect and that you always have the chance to keep improving, and you definitely will the more you do it.